Chapter Seven of Matilda. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cory Samuel. Matilda, by Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. Chapter Seven. With a beating heart and fearful, I knew not why. I dismissed the servant, and, locking my door, sat down to read my father's letter. These are the words that it contained. My dear child, I have betrayed your confidence, I have endeavoured to pollute your mind, and have made your innocent heart acquainted with the looks and language of unlawful and monstrous passion. I must expiate these crimes and must endeavour in some degree to proportionate my punishment to my guilt. You are, I doubt, not prepared for what I am about to announce. We must separate, and be divided for ever. I deprive you of your parent and only friend. You are cast out shelterless on the world. Your hopes are blasted, the peace and security of your pure mind destroyed. Memory will bring to you frightful images of guilt, and the anguish of innocent love betrayed. Yet I, who draw down all this misery upon you, I who cast you forth, and remorselessly have set the seal of distrust and agony on the heart and brow of my own child, who, with devilish levity, have endeavoured to steal away her loveliness, to place in its stead the foul deformity of sin. I, in the overflowing anguish of my heart, supplicate you to forgive me. I do not ask your pity. You must and do abhor me. But pardon me, Matilda, and let not your thoughts follow me in my banishment with unrelenting anger. I must never more behold you, never more hear your voice. But the soft whisperings of your forgiveness will reach me and cool the burning of my disordered brain and heart. I am sure I should feel it, even in my grave. And I dare enforce this request, by relating how miserably I was betrayed into this net of fiery anguish, and all my struggles to release myself. Indeed, if your soul was less pure and bright, I would not attempt to exculpate myself to you. I should fear that if I led you to regard me with less abhorrence, you might hate vice less. But in addressing you I feel as if I appealed to an angelic judge. I cannot depart without your forgiveness, and I must endeavour to gain it, or I must despair. I conjure you, therefore, to listen to my words, and if with the good guilt may be in any degree extenuated by sharp agony, and remorse that rends the brain as madness, perhaps you may think, though I dare not that I have some claim to your compassion. I entreat you to call to your remembrance our first happy life on the shores of Loch Lomond. I had arrived from a weary wandering of sixteen years, during which, although I had gone through many dangers and misfortunes, my affections had been an entire blank. If I grieved, it was for your mother. If I loved, it was your image. These sole emotions filled my heart in quietness. The human creatures around me excited in me no sympathy, and I thought that the mighty change that the death of your mother had wrought within me had rendered me callous to any future impression. I saw the lovely, and I did not love. I imagined, therefore, that all warmth was extinguished in my heart, except that which led me ever to dwell on your then infantine image. It is a strange link in my fate, that without having seen you I should passionately love you. During my wanderings I never slept without first calling down gentle dreams on your head. If I saw a lovely woman, I thought, does my Matilda resemble her? All delightful things, sublime scenery, soft breezes, exquisite music, seemed to me associated with you and only through you to be pleasant to me. At length, 
I saw you. You appeared as the deity of a lovely region, the ministering angel of a paradise, to which, of all humankind, you admitted only me. I dared hardly consider you as my daughter. Your beauty, artlessness, and untaught wisdom seemed to belong to a higher order of things. Your voice breathed forth only words of love. If there was aught of earthly in you, it was only what you derived from the beauty of the world. You seem to have gained a grace from the mountain breezes, the waterfalls, and the lake. And this was all of earthly, except your affections, that you had. There was no dross, no bad feeling in the composition. You yet, even, have not seen enough of the world to know the stupendous difference that exists between the women we meet in daily life and a nymph of the woods such as you were, in whose eyes alone mankind may study for centuries, and grow wiser and purer. Those divine lights which shone on me, as did those of Beatrice upon Dante, and well might I say with him, yet with what different feelings, e quasi mi perdi gli occhi cini. Can you wonder, Matilda? that I dwelt on your looks, your words, your motions, and drank in unmixed delight. But I am afraid that I wander from my purpose. I must be more brief, for night draws on apace, and all my hours in this house are counted. Well, we removed to London, and still I felt only the peace of sinless passion. You were ever with me and I desired no more than to gaze on your countenance, and to know that I was all the world to you. I was lapped in a fool's paradise of enjoyment and security. Was my love blamable? If it was, I was ignorant of it. I desired only that which I possessed, and if I enjoyed from your looks and words and most innocent caresses a rapture usually excluded from the feelings of a parent towards his child, yet no uneasiness, no wish, no casual idea awoke me to a sense of guilt. I loved you as a human father might be supposed to love a daughter, born to him by a heavenly mother, as Anchises might have regarded the child of Venus if the sex had been changed. Love, mingled with respect and adoration. Perhaps also my passion was lulled to content by the deep and exclusive affection you felt for me. But when I saw you become the object of another's love, when I imagined that you might be loved otherwise than as a sacred type and image of loveliness and excellence, or that you might love another with a more ardent affection than that which you bore to me, then the fiend awoke within me. I dismissed your lover, and from that moment I have known no peace. I have sought in vain for sleep and rest. My lids refused to close, and my blood was for ever in a tumult. I awoke to a new life, as one who dies in hope might wake in hell. I will not sully your imagination by recounting my combats, my self-anger, and my despair. Let a veil be drawn over the unimaginable sensations of a guilty father. The secrets of so agonized a heart may not be made vulgar. All was uproar, crime, remorse, and hate, yet still the tenderest love. And what first awoke me to the firm resolve of conquering my passion, and of restoring her father to my child, was the sight of your bitter and sympathizing sorrows. It was this that led me here. I thought that if I could again awaken in my heart the grief I had felt at the loss of your mother, and the many associations with her memory which had been laid to sleep for seventeen years, that all love for her child would become extinct. In a fit of heroism I determined to go alone, to quit you, the life of my life, and not to see you again until I might guiltlessly but it would not do. I rated my fortitude too high, or my love too low. 
I should certainly have died if you had not hastened to me. Would that I had been indeed extinguished. And now, Matilda, I must make you my last confession. I have been miserably mistaken in imagining that I could conquer my love for you. I never can. The sight of this house, these fields and woods, which my first love inhabited, seems to have increased it. In my madness I dared say to myself, Diana died to give her birth, her mother's spirit was transferred into her frame, and she ought to be as Diana to me. With every effort to cast it off, this love clings closer, this guilty love more unnatural than hate, that withers your hopes, and destroys me for ever. Better have loved despair, and safer kissed her. No time or space can tear from my soul that which makes a part of it. Since my arrival here, I have not for a moment ceased to feel the hell of passion which has been implanted in me to burn until all be cold and stiff and dead. Yet I will not die. Alas! How dare I go where I may meet Diana, when I have disobeyed her last request, her last words, said in a faint voice, when all feeling but love, which survives all things else, was already dead. She then bade me make her child happy. That thought alone gives a double sting to death. I will wander away from you, away from all life, in the solitude I seek, I alone shall breathe of human kind. I must endure life, and as it is my duty, so I shall, until the grave dreaded, yet desired, receive me free from pain. For while I feel it will be pain that must make up the whole sum of my sensations, is not this a fearful curse that I labour under? Do I not look forward to a miserable future? My child, if, after this life, I am permitted to see you again, if pain can purify the heart, mine will be pure. If remorse may expiate guilt, I shall be guiltless. I have been at the door of your chamber. Everything is quiet. You sleep. Do you indeed sleep, Matilda? Spirits of good, behold the tears of my earnest prayer. Bless my child. Protect her from the selfish among her fellow-creatures. Protect her from the agonies of passion, and the despair of disappointment. Peace, hope, and love be thy guardians, O thou soul of my soul, thou in whom I breathe. I dare not read my letter over, for I have no time to write another and yet I fear that some expressions in it might displease me. Since I last saw you I have been constantly employed in writing letters, and have several more to write, for I do not intend that any one shall hear of me after I depart. I need not conjure you to look upon me as one of whom all links that once existed between us are broken. Your own delicacy will not allow you, I am convinced, to attempt to trace me. It is far better for your peace that you should be ignorant of my destination. You will not follow me, for when I banish myself would you nourish guilt by obtruding yourself upon me? You will not do this, I know you will not. You must forget me and all the evil that I have taught you. Cast off the only gift that I have bestowed upon you, your grief, and rise from under my blighting influence as no flower so sweet ever did rise from beneath so much evil. You will never hear from me again. Receive these, then, as the last words of mine that will ever reach you, and although I have forfeited your filial love, yet regard them, I conjure you, as a father's command. Resolutely shake off the wretchedness that this first misfortune in early life must occasion you. Bear boldly up against the storm, continue wise and mild, 
but believe it, and indeed it is, your duty to be happy. You are very young. Let not this check, for more than a moment, retard your glorious course. Hold on, beloved one. The sun of youth is not set for you. It will restore vigour and life to you. Do not resist with obstinate grief its beneficent influence. O oh, my child, bless me with the hope that I have not utterly destroyed you. Farewell, Matilda. I go with the belief that I have your pardon. Your gentle nature would not permit you to hate your greatest enemy, and though I be he, although I have rent happiness from your grasp, though I have passed over your young love and hopes as the angel of destruction, finding beauty and joy, and leaving blight and despair, yet you will forgive me, and with eyes overflowing with tears I thank you, my beloved one. I accept your pardon with a gratitude that will never die, and that will, indeed it will, outlive guilt and remorse. Farewell for ever. The moment I finished this letter, I ordered the carriage, and prepared to follow my father. The words of his letter by which he had dissuaded me from this step were those that determined me. Why did he write them? He must know that if I believed that his intention was merely to absent himself from me, that instead of opposing him it would be that which I should myself require. Or if he thought that any lurking feeling, yet he could not think that, should lead me to him, would he endeavour to overthrow the only hope he could have of ever seeing me again. A lover, there was madness in the thought, yet he was my lover, would not act thus. No. He had determined to die, and he wished to spare me the misery of knowing it. The few ineffectual words he had said concerning his duty were to me a further proof, and the more I studied the letter, the more did I perceive a thousand slight expressions that could only indicate a knowledge that life was now over for him. He was about to die. My blood froze at the thought. A sickening feeling of horror came over me that allowed not of tears. As I waited for the carriage, I walked up and down with a quick pace. Then kneeling, and passionately clasping my hands, I tried to pray. But my voice was choked by convulsive sobs. Oh, the sun shone, the air was balmy. He must yet live, for if he were dead all would surely be black as night to me. The motion of the carriage, knowing that it carried me towards him, and that I might perhaps find him alive, somewhat revived my courage, yet I had a dreadful ride. Hope only supported me, the hope that I should not be too late. I did not weep, but I wiped the perspiration from my brow, and tried to still my brain and heart beating almost to madness. Oh. I must not be mad when I see him. Or perhaps it were as well that I should be. My distraction might calm his, and recall him to the endurance of life. Yet until I find him I must force reason to keep her seat. And I pressed my forehead hard with my hands. Oh, do not leave me, or I shall forget what I am about. Instead of driving on as we ought with the speed of lightning, they will attend to me, and we shall be too late. Oh, God help me! Let him be alive! It is all dark. In my abject misery I demand no more. No hope, no good, only passion, and guilt, and horror. But alive! Alive! My sensations choked me. No tears fell, yet I sobbed, and breathed short and hard. One only thought possessed me, and I could only utter one word that half-screaming was perpetually on my lips. Alive! Alive! I had taken the steward with me, for he, much better than I, could make the requisite inquiries. The poor old man could not restrain his tears, as he saw my deep distress and knew the cause. He sometimes uttered a few broken words of consolation. In moments like these, 
the mistress and servant, become in a manner equals. And when I saw his old dim eyes wet with sympathizing tears, his grey hair thinly scattered on an age-wrinkled brow, I thought, oh, if my father were as he is, decrepit and hoary, then I should be spared this pain. When I had arrived at the nearest town, I took post-horses, and followed the road my father had taken. At every inn where we changed horses we heard of him, and I was possessed by alternate hope and fear. At length I found that he had altered his route. At first he had followed the London road, but now he changed it, and upon inquiry I found that the one which he now pursued led towards the sea. My dream recurred to my thoughts. I was not usually superstitious, but in wretchedness every one is so. The sea was fifty miles off, yet it was towards it that he fled. The idea was terrible to my half-crazed imagination, and almost overturned the little self-possession that still remained to me. I journeyed all day. Every moment my misery increased, and the fever of my blood became intolerable. The summer sun shone in an unclouded sky. The air was close, but all was cool to me, except my own scorching skin. Towards evening dark thunderclouds arose above the horizon, and I heard its distant roll. After sunset they darkened the whole sky, and it began to rain. The lightning lighted up the whole country, and the thunder drowned the noise of our carriage. At the next inn my father had not taken horses. He had left a box there, saying he would return, and had walked over the fields to the town of a seacoast town eight miles off. For a moment I was almost paralysed by fear, but my energy returned and I demanded a guide to accompany me in following his steps. The night was tempestuous, but my bribe was high, and I easily procured a countryman. We passed through many lanes, and over fields and wild downs. The rain poured down in torrents and the loud thunder broke in terrible crashes over our heads. Oh, what a night it was! And I passed on with quick steps, among the high, dank grass, amid the rain and tempest. My dream was for ever in my thoughts, and with a kind of half-insanity that often possesses the mind in despair, I said, Courage! We are not near the sea! We are yet several miles from the ocean! Yet it was towards the sea that our direction lay, and that heightened the confusion of my ideas. Once, overcome by fatigue, I sunk on the wet earth. About two hundred yards distant, alone in a large meadow, stood a magnificent oak. The lightnings showed its myriad boughs torn by the storm. A strange idea seized me. A person must have felt all the agonies of doubt concerning the life and death of one who is the whole world to them, before they can enter into my feelings. For in that state the mind working unrestrained by the will makes strange and fanciful combinations with outward circumstances, and weaves the chances and changes of nature into an immediate connection with the event they dread. It was with this feeling that I turned to the old steward who stood pale and trembling next to me. Mark, Gasper, if the next flash of lightning rend not that oak, my father will be alive. I had scarcely uttered these words, than a flash instantly followed by a tremendous peal of thunder descended on it, and when my eyes recovered their sight, after the dazzling light, the oak no longer stood in the meadow. The old man uttered a wild exclamation of horror when he saw so sudden an interpretation given to my prophecy. I started up. My strength returned. With my terror I cried, O oh God, is this thy decree? Yet perhaps I shall not be too late. 
although still several miles distant, we continued to approach the sea. We came at last to the road that led to the town of and at an inn there we heard that my father had passed by somewhat before sunset. He had observed the approaching storm, and had hired a horse for the next town, which was situated a mile from the sea, that he might arrive there before it should commence. This town was five miles off. We hired a chase here, and with four horses drove with speed through the storm. My garments were wet and clung around me and my hair hung in straight locks on my neck, when not blown aside by the wind. I shivered, yet my pulse was high with fever. Great God! What agony I endured! I shed no tears, but my eyes, wild and inflamed, were starting from my head. I could hardly support the weight that pressed upon my brain. We arrived at the town of in a little more than half an hour. When my father had arrived, the storm had already begun, but he had refused to stop, and leaving his horse there, he walked on, towards the sea. Alas! It was double cruelty in him to have chosen the sea for his fatal resolve. It was adding madness to my despair. The poor servant, who was with me, endeavoured to persuade me to remain here, and to let him go alone. I shook my head silently and sadly. Sick almost to death, I leant upon his arm, and as there was no road for a chase, dragged my weary steps across the desolate downs to meet my fate, now too certain for the agony of doubt. Almost fainting, I slowly approached the fatal waters. When we had quitted the town we heard their roaring. I whispered to myself, in a muttering voice, The sound is the same as that which I heard in my dream. It is the knell of my father which I hear. The rain had ceased. There was no more thunder and lightning. The wind had paused. My heart no longer beat wildly. I did not feel any fever. But I was chilled. My knees sunk under me. I almost slept as I walked with excess of weariness. Every limb trembled. I was silent. All was silent, except the roaring of the sea, which became louder and more dreadful. Yet we advanced slowly. Sometimes I thought that we should never arrive, that the sound of waves would still allure us, and that we should walk on for ever and ever, field succeeding field, Never would our weary journey cease, nor night, nor day. But still we should hear the dashing of the sea, and to all this there would be no end. Wild beyond the imagination of the happy are the thoughts bred by misery and despair. At length we reached the overhanging beach. A cottage stood beside the path. We knocked at the door, and it was opened. The bed within instantly caught my eye. Something stiff and straight lay on it, covered by a sheet. The cottagers looked aghast. The first words that they uttered confirmed what I before knew. I did not feel shocked or overcome. I believe that I asked one or two questions and listened to the answers. I hardly know. But in a few moments I sank lifeless to the ground, and so would that then all had been at an end. End of chapter 7